This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Good morning and welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. My name is Dustin Smith, and as always, I will be your host. This week, we have episode 255 entitled The Messiah in Psalm 132. Now, I bet if I were to poll the listeners that the 132nd Psalm is not the most popular psalm in your collection of favorite passages. It's probably not something that is calligraphied on a pillow. It's not something that's written up on your mirror as kind of the verse that inspires you throughout the day. And yet, as we're going to demonstrate today, it is a psalm that deeply influenced the expectation of the Messiah. It influenced and impacted the way that the person of the Messiah was understood, particularly in the Messiah's relationship to David, the Israelite king. And this week we will round out our study of the Psalms in our ongoing study of the Messianic influences from the Old Testament upon the writers of the New Testament, and of course, upon the early Jews who built up these Messianic expectations. Next week, we will turn to the book of Proverbs. But for this week's episode, there are some questions I would like to explore in our study. First, what is the purpose of Psalm 132 and its relationship to the Davidic kingship? Second, what is said specifically about the descendant of David in the psalm, and why do these details really matter? And lastly, how frequently do the New Testament authors portray Jesus as the son of David, and how does this characterize his unique humanity? Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today is a close look at Psalm 132. Psalm 132 is a medium-length psalm, so we'll be able to read it in its entirety and offer a few comments here and there. Let's begin. Psalm 132, verse 1. Remember, O Yahweh, on David's behalf, all his affliction. How he swore to Yahweh and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, Surely I will not enter my house, nor lie on my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, nor slumber to my eyelids, until I find a place for Yahweh, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. That's the first five verses. So what we can see here is that the psalmist, who is not David, obviously, The psalmist is petitioning the God of Israel, petitioning Yahweh, to remember David, to remember what David said. David had promised that he would not enter his own house until there was a house for God. And this, of course, was a reference ultimately to the house of God, that is, the temple. David was not able to build the temple. That was David's son, Solomon, who was the temple builder. But this is the beginning of the psalm, is that it's remembering that David had this desire to set aside his own privileges and well-being in order that God may have a temple, a dwelling place. Let's move on, verse 6. Behold, we heard it in Epaphrath, we found it in the field of Jaar. Let us go into his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Yahweh, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your godly ones sing for joy. For the sake of David, your servant, do not turn away your face of your anointed. Yahweh has sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body, I 
will set upon your throne. That's verses 6 through 11. So now the psalmist is recalling the fact that, yes, there is a temple, and there is the encouragement to others. Let us go to this dwelling place. Let us go to this house, and let us participate in worship. This temple, of course, is the resting place of Yahweh. The Ark of the Covenant is located there. And there are priests and godly ones that are performing their functions. They are singing. They are participating in the temple cult. And then we can actually see here the request from the psalmist in verse 10. For David's sake, David your servant, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Now the anointed one is, of course, the king. And the king is one who descends from David's line. So what we can indicate here is that there is some sort of request to show favor to the anointed king. And this is based on the promise that God had made to David. And this promise, of course, is mentioned in verse 11 of the fruit of your body. Yahweh says, I will set upon your throne. So there's a promise here that the descendants of David, and by descendants, it is quite clear, it is the fruit of David's body. They are literal descendants. They are part of David's family tree. They are the sons and the grandsons and the great-grandsons of David going on for generation after generation after generation. David is their human ancestor. It seems a little silly that I have to continue to point this out, but we have to make it clear because of the way that the New Testament authors draw upon these passages. Verse 11 is quite clear. Yahweh has sworn to David. He swore this. He made this solemn promise, and he is not going to turn his back. It's a double comment there indicating the This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Good morning and welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. My name is Dustin Smith, and as always, I will be your host. This week, we have episode 255 entitled The Messiah in Psalm 132. Now, I bet if I were to poll the listeners, that the 132nd psalm is not the most popular psalm in your collection of favorite passages. It's probably not something that is calligraphied on a pillow. It's not something that's written up on your mirror as kind of the verse that inspires you throughout the day. And yet, as we're going to demonstrate today, it is a psalm that deeply influenced the expectation of the Messiah. It influenced and impacted the way that the person of the Messiah was understood, particularly in the Messiah's relationship to David, the Israelite king. And this week we will round out our study of the Psalms in our ongoing study of the Messianic influences from the Old Testament upon the writers of the New Testament, and of course, upon the early Jews who built up these messianic expectations. Next week, we will turn to the book of Proverbs. But for this week's episode, there are some questions I would like to explore in our study. First, what is the purpose of Psalm 132 and its relationship to the Davidic kingship? Second, What is said specifically about the descendant of David in the psalm, and why do these details really matter? And lastly, how frequently do the New Testament authors portray Jesus as the son of David, and how does this characterize his unique humanity? Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today is a close look at Psalm 132. 
Psalm 132 is a medium length psalm, so we'll be able to read it in its entirety and offer a few comments here and there. Let's begin. Psalm 132, verse 1. Remember, O Yahweh, on David's behalf, all his affliction how he swore to Yahweh and vowed to the Mighty One of Jacob, Surely I will not enter my house, nor lie on my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, nor slumber to my eyelids, until I find a place for Yahweh, a dwelling place for the Mighty One of Jacob. That's the first five verses. So what we can see here is that the psalmist, who is not David, obviously, the psalmist is petitioning the God of Israel, petitioning Yahweh, to remember David, to remember what David said. David had promised that he would not enter his own house until there was a house for God. And this, of course, was a reference ultimately to the house of God, that is, the temple. David was not able to build the temple. That was David's son, Solomon, who was the temple builder. But this is the beginning of the psalm, is that it's remembering that David had this desire to set aside his own privileges and well-being in order that God may have a temple, a dwelling place. Let's move on, verse 6. Behold, we heard it in Epaphrath, we found it in the field of Ja'ar. Let us go into his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Yahweh, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your godly ones sing for joy. For the sake of David, your servant, do not turn away your face of your anointed. Yahweh has sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body, I will set upon your throne. That's verses 6 through 11. So now the psalmist is recalling the fact that, yes, there is a temple, and there is the encouragement to others. Let us go to this dwelling place. Let us go to this house, and let us participate in worship. This temple, of course, is the resting place of Yahweh. The Ark of the Covenant is located there. And there are priests and godly ones that are performing their functions. They are singing. They are participating in the temple cult. And then we can actually see here the request from the psalmist in verse 10. For David's sake, David your servant, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Now, the anointed one is, of course, the king. And the king is one who descends from David's line. So what we can indicate here is that there is some sort of request to show favor to the anointed king. And this is based on the promise that God had made to David. And this promise, of course, is mentioned in verse 11 of the fruit of your body. Yahweh says, I will set upon your throne. So there's a promise here that the descendants of David, and by descendants, it is quite clear, it is the fruit of David's body. They are literal descendants. They are part of David's family tree. They are the sons of and the grandsons and the great-grandsons of David going on for generation after generation after generation. David is their human ancestor. It seems a little silly that I have to continue to point this out, but we have to make it clear because of the way that the New Testament authors draw upon these passages. Verse 11 is quite clear. Yahweh has sworn to David. He swore this. He made this solemn promise, and he is not going to turn his back. It's a double comment there indicating the truthfulness that God is going to give to this promise. Of the fruit of David's body, 
Yahweh is going to set upon David's throne. So the suggestion here is that the psalm is longing for a king to be restored to David's throne. Perhaps it's something that happened after the exile, even though the temple is located here. This is perhaps the rebuilt temple. There is not a Davidic descendant occupying that particular throne. So this is likely something written in the post-exilic period. Let's move on. Verse 12. This is Yahweh continuing to say, If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I will teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forever. This is part of the Davidic covenant, which is that the descendants of David have to behave. They have to continue to demonstrate their obedience. They can't get out of line. And the promise there is that those who keep the covenant will sit on David's throne forever. That's a very important promise. Verse 13, For Yahweh has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her needy with bread. Her priest also I will clothe with salvation, and her godly ones will sing aloud for joy. There I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. I prepared a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall shine. And that's the 18 verses in Psalm 132. And so we can see the promise that Zion, that is Jerusalem, continues to be the chosen place for Yahweh. And the way that God chooses it is that he is going to dwell there in the midst of the temple and also continue to occupy that location with a Davidic king, a Davidic descendant, one who's going to be obedient, one who's going to be faithful, and one who specifically is going to come from David's own body. From the fruit of your body, I will set upon your throne. So this created the expectation for the Messiah, that the Messiah, of course, would be of the line of David, meaning that he had to be from the tribe of Judah. He couldn't be from the tribe of Benjamin. He couldn't be from tribe of Naphtali or Asher or any of the other tribes. He had to be from the tribe of Judah because that's the tribe from which David found his place. And of course, the promise is that he was going to sit upon the throne of David forever, which is geographically located in Jerusalem. And this is the expectation of the Messiah. When we get to the New Testament, it is quite clear that all these expectations are held and maintained by the New Testament writers, and they see Jesus as the son of David. Son of David, in fact, becomes a widespread messianic title. Let's move to our second point. Point number two, the use of Psalm 132's Descendant of David theme within the New Testament. Now, as we pointed out, verse 11, Psalm 132, indicates that it is from the fruit of David's body that this descendant is going to come. He is a descendant of David. He is from David's family tree. He is a physical family member of David to where David is his ancestor. David is one of the forefathers of the Messiah. That is one of the qualifications to be the Messiah. The Messiah could not be an angelic being because an angel is not the son of David. And the opening verse of the New Testament confirms this widely held expectation. In Matthew 1, verse 1, it says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Matthew goes to great lengths to demonstrate the fact that Jesus really is the Messiah. But in order to point that out, he has to prove that Jesus really did descend from 
from David's line. And so we have this long-standing genealogy, and you don't get too far in it before you see, as we see here in Matthew 1, 6, that Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. So this genealogy, which goes from Jesse to David to Solomon, points out, by the way, David is the king, and Jesus is the son of David, meaning Jesus is the heir of David's promised kingship, and he's to be the heir of the very famous Davidic covenant. Before the genealogy comes to its conclusion, Matthew makes sure to have a good summary. In verse 17, it says, All the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. That's Matthew 1.17. And this, of course, recaps the history of Israel from some of its highest points and some of its lowest points. We have, of course, Abraham, one of the high points, David, one of the high points, the deportation, the exile to Babylon, that's one of the low points. And then we have, of course, all the way to the Messiah. And David is, of course, mentioned as one of the high points of Israel's history. So Matthew is quite clear. He doesn't even begin the narrative of Jesus' life before he quite clearly indicates that Jesus is the descendant of David. And that, of course, makes Jesus a human being. He's a member of the human race because David was a human being. To be a descendant of a human being, of course, makes you human. That's how all human descendants throughout the last thousands and thousands of years have functioned throughout all of human history. Now I want to show you how Mark likes to pick up the understanding of Jesus as the son of David. And he does so in an interesting story that is a controversy story. So Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23, it says, And it happened that he, Jesus, was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, that's Jesus said to the Pharisees, Have you never read what David did when he was in need? And he and his companions became hungry. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. That's Mark 2, verses 23 through 26. Now, you might think that the story seems a little bit odd in our particular study, but what I think Mark is doing is Mark is looking at this controversy. You've got Jesus and his disciples who are doing work on the Sabbath. They are eating food in order to refresh themselves. And in defense of this particular action, Jesus says, hey, have you heard about David? Now, David also, when he and his companions became hungry, were able to go and do something that only the priests were able to do. They went in there and they ate food to refresh them, and they were innocent. They were not guilty of this. And so what Jesus is actually doing in this passage, I think this is what Mark has in mind, is that he's saying, look, if David and his companions were able to do this, and they were innocent, guess who I am? And guess who my companions are? Jesus is referring to himself as the new David. He is the son of David. Jesus is implicitly telling everybody that he is the descendant of David. And this controversy story, of course, points to his identity. That's the only way to make sense of why he would point David out. And again, it's not just David, it's David and his companions, because it's Jesus and his companions. Jesus sees himself as the new David. And many of the other gospel writers pick up the story and they also retell it. But it indicates, of course, that Mark believes that Jesus is the son of David.
We turn to the Gospel of Luke. In the first chapter, Luke makes it quite clear that the promised birth of the Messiah is going to be someone who is of the line of David. So in Luke 132, we have Gabriel telling Mary that Jesus will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Luke 132 through 33, one of my favorite passages from the Gospel of Luke. It tells us a great many things about Messianic theology. We can see that in verse 32, that Jesus is going to be called the Son of the Most High, meaning he's not the Most High God. He is the Son of the Most High God, and his father is David. The Lord God is going to give to Jesus the throne of his father, David. David is going to be his ancestor. That is quite clear. And this works, of course, because God ultimately creates Jesus, but David is the ancestor of Mary and, of course, of Joseph. The genealogies indicate both of those particular points. So it doesn't matter that God, of course, is the father. That doesn't take away the fact that Jesus descends from the line of David on both Mary and Joseph's side of the family. Because Jesus is the son of God and he is the son of David because David is his father. And of course, the promise is that he's going to reign forever and that his kingdom is going to have no end. So from Luke's perspective, Jesus is the son of David, the lineal descendant of David, even though God is technically Jesus' father. Gospel of John also alludes to the fact that the messianic expectation that was going around indicated that the Messiah was to be a descendant of David. So in John chapter 7, verse 42, the crowds are discussing and they say, Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? That's in John 7, verse 42. Of course, the scripture that mentions this is from Micah chapter 5. So their point is actually true. And they're not disputing the fact that the Messiah is to actually be a descendant of David. The dispute, actually, is that, is this person Jesus? And we don't know where he is from. Is he the Messiah? So they're not disputing the qualifications of the Messiah, and that the Messiah comes from the descendants of David. David's own descendants, his family tree, his own lineage. He's a human descendant from David. They're not disputing that. They're disputing whether Jesus actually is this particular promised Messiah. So all four gospel writers indicate the awareness of the messianic expectation involving David, and they position Jesus as fulfilling those qualifications. Namely, Jesus is the descendant of David, which makes Jesus a human being. Paul, of course, makes this part of his gospel message. We can see this at the opening of Romans, a very, very important passage in Romans 1 verse 1, it says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. That's Romans 1 verses 1 through 3. And here again, we can see that Jesus is the son of God. Paul talks about the gospel of God. And this gospel concerns his son. Whose son? Well, God's son. God, of course, is described here as having a son. And the son is, of course, a descendant of David. So to be a descendant of David means you are a lineal descendant of David. And this is part of Paul's gospel. This is what Paul would preach because Paul preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. And that, of course, meant that the Messiah is the one who fulfills the Davidic covenant, the one who is to be the heir of the Davidic kingdom. So you have to talk about the Messiah, the Son of God, 
who is the descendant of David, and everything that that entails. That's part of Paul's gospel. That's extremely important. We could see this reaffirmed in 2 Timothy 2.8. 2 Timothy 2.8 says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. Again, we could see the aspect of Jesus being the descendant of David as part of of the gospel message. The understanding of Jesus as the human descendant of King David was part of the saving message of salvation. We can see that in Romans, and we can see that in 2 Timothy. And then we can look at the last book of the New Testament, at least as it's arranged, the book of Revelation. And in two places, it is affirmed that Jesus is the descendant of David, the shoot and the descendant of David. In chapter 5, we have an angel announcing this particular fact, but in chapter 22, Jesus himself affirms this particular designation. So in Revelation 22:16, Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the shoot and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. That's Revelation twenty two sixteen. So who did Jesus think that he was? Well, he doesn't seem to think that he's God. He doesn't think that he's Yahweh. He's certainly not the Father. He says, look, I am the shoot and the descendant of David. Thereby, he is the one who fulfills the Davidic promises as the one who comes from the fruit of David's own body, as we saw in Psalm 132, verse 11. So as we can see, the New Testament writers were quite clear to indicate not just that Jesus was the son of David, but that Jesus was the seed of David, the descendant of David, the one who comes from David's own loins, from David's own body. He is from the fruit of David's body, as we saw, indicated in Psalm 132. So there you have it. That is the various ways in which Psalm 132 shaped and formed the expectation of the Messiah. And the important takeaway here is that Jesus being the son of David means that he is unquestionably a human being. He is a man. He is a member of the human race. And that means that he is not a heavenly angel. He's not an angelic being. And he's certainly not the God of Israel. So thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Join us next week as we shift from our study of the Psalms to looking at the book of Proverbs. I have no idea how many episodes we'll look at with the book of Proverbs because the more I study, the more I see the New Testament writers drawing from the influence of Proverbs in their portrayal of Jesus. So please look forward to our next episode. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us as we aim to promote the sound truths of the oneness and unity of God and the humanity of Jesus. You can support us for absolutely free by subscribing on iTunes or YouTube, by giving us an honest review on iTunes, and by sharing an episode with your friends. If you'd like to offer a financial donation to help keep the Biblical Unitarian Podcast on the air, you can check out the episode description for a PayPal link. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is produced and edited by Dustin Williams. I am Dustin Smith, your host. Until next time, please take care.